Researchers at the Abdul Latif Jamil Institute for Disease and Emergency Analytics are working hard to learn more about the current coronavirus outbreak. Today, I will speak with experts who will give us an update on the status of the epidemic and learn more about a recent report on phylogenetic analysis. I will now speak with Professor Neil Ferguson, Director of JIDEA, for an update on the current coronavirus outbreak. Thank you for joining us today, Professor Ferguson. Can you give us an update on the current status of the coronavirus outbreak? So we see a kind of complex picture around the world. It's almost certainly true that case numbers are declining in Wuhan, partly perhaps as a result of the control measures, but the epidemic we would have predicted to be peaking around this time in any case, I and mean, the peak may have been accelerated and the drop accelerated by control measures. In the rest of China, it's more difficult to assess what's going on. Official case numbers are declining. That may be partly due to the very intensive controls restricting people's contacts, going, people are not going to work or school at the moment. Partly it may be down to who is being prioritised for testing. There's limited testing capacity and people with links to Wuhan are being prioritised. So Wuhan's going down, we'd expect to see case numbers elsewhere go down in the official statistics. What will be critical is what happens in the next few weeks as China reopens its schools and workplaces and whether we see a resurgence of transmission. Outside China, we see continued cases detected around the world perhaps two of particular concern in terms of numbers and what's being seen in those countries are Japan and Singapore, both of which have identified you know, local transmission. It's perhaps too early to say whether it's truly self-sustaining, it's truly the beginning of an epidemic in those countries. Japan, though, does appear to have clusters of cases on link to other cases. And we would expect Japan to be ahead of many other countries. It's one of the most connected countries to China. The Japanese are doing all they can, but it's a large country with a large population, so it's very challenging to really suppress spread, short of the very expensive measures China has introduced. So we're in a, in a period at the moment where we're, we're waiting to see whether epidemics start in other countries. The modelling and the analysis would indicate we would expect to see them, but we might not pick them up in routine surveillance systems for another few weeks. All the case finding at the moment is restricted to you know, people with links to China. Detecting clusters of pneumonia cases unlinked to China will rely on normal health system you know, sensitivity of, of surveillance, which is much, much less, requires some doctor to decide to test. And so there may be two, three, four weeks where we don't appear to see very much going on. But under the surface, there is ongoing change of transmission in several countries around the world. Can you explain what the current scientific response entails and what the most urgent research questions are that scientists are working on? I mean, if I should first say that there's been a truly amazing international response, both in terms of coordination, data sharing, Pre-publication of results, which is important in a fast-moving situation, not necessarily waiting for peer review. And that spanned all aspects of science, from what we do here, epidemiology, uh, mathematical modelling, but also the clinical response, understanding the clinical picture of disease, development and countermeasures, now, drugs, treatments, vaccines. So across the board, it's been admirable. The World Health Organization last week organised a meeting to further enhance that coordination and set priorities going forward. Speaking personally, I think the most important things to get a handle on are the potential scale of the outbreak, you know, who is at risk, who is not at risk of being infected, refining our understanding of who's at risk of severe disease particularly, getting a better handle on all the many drugs which are being tried on severe cases in China, which are actually reducing death rates, and that requires really very good either observational data or better still clinical trial data from those drugs because... That information needs to be shared quickly to you know, assist other countries in their response. Clearly, development of vaccines is important long term. The other thing is, I think, a handle on whether countries can at least slow spread or reduce the scale of the epidemic through what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions. So, you know, changing people's normal habits, closing schools, for instance, restricting mass gatherings, telling most people to work at home if they can, those are the sort of measures which China has introduced in quite a draconian fashion. They appear to be slowing spread, if not stopping it completely. They have enormous economic costs, though. They may not be feasible for many countries to do, but understanding what subset of those many interventions could actually have a substantial impact is also important. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. 
following the online release of the team's fifth report, I will now speak with Dr. Eric Voltz, lecturer at Imperial College, to learn more about the phylogenetic analysis. Thank you for being here with us today. Can you explain what phylogenetic analysis is? Phylogenetic analysis is the study of ancestral relationships. With viruses like the new coronavirus, we infer those ancestral relationships by looking for differences in genetic sequences. And when we know when genetic sequences are sampled through time, we can also look at how genetic diversity of the virus changes through time and work out the likely time and location uh, of when the virus emerged in humans. How does understanding the genetic diversity of a virus contribute to the outbreak response? Uh, genetic data is a, a completely independent source of information about how the epidemic is unfolding. So we can use sequence data to estimate growth rates and time of origin and compare that to estimates based on standard surveillance data. What are the key findings of the report? So we, we looked at 53 whole genome sequences of the new coronavirus uh, that have been released publicly and which have been analyzed by scientists all over the world collaboratively. And our findings are, are very much in line with previous investigations. We estimate an epidemic doubling time of around seven days that corresponds to a growth rate of around 10% per day. We estimate a time of common ancestry of these sequences to be December 8th, with a margin of error of about two weeks in either direction. And we also get very approximate estimates of the epidemic size through time. If we assume that the epidemic was growing exponentially throughout January, then we get an estimate of around 40,000 infections at the end of January. And in order for those estimates to be consistent with the epidemiological record, which showed around 20,000 infections at the same time, we need to assume high levels of dispersion of transmission rates, which has a very strong effect on genetic diversity. So we think that this shows evidence for a high level of transmission in a minority of patients. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. We will continue to work together with the international scientific community to find shared answers to shared problems.